So I'm going to um, reflect a little bit, as the title of the talk suggests, on a what, what I'd like to think of as a, an arc of memorial vernacular <clears throat> that uh, really begins uh, in the early 20th century, not long after World War I, uh, with some of the very first World War I memorials, um, and ended up um, uh, with Holocaust memorials, counter memorials in Germany, um, Maya Lin's uh, amazing Vietnam veterans memorial design and that competition. Um, and continuing through the Denkmal, the Berlin's memorial uh, for the murdered Jews of Europe, <clears throat> and kind of ending up in uh, uh, downtown 9 11 uh, memorial, uh, where again, I'm just going to trace these memorial preoccupations and just to show not that there's a, a direct uh, line connecting all of them, but how, especially post Holocaust, there was really a preoccupation with. Um, uh, absence, um, <clears throat> kind of very difficult to redeem or compensate uh, uh, you know, literature and forms. And, um, and the, some of this uh, goes back uh, for me, really on the date um, that we announced the winning design in January 2004 of the, uh, what was then called the World Trade Center Memorial Competition or the 9-11 Memorial Competition, won by Michael Rod and Peter Walker, um, with a uh, our question, the first question I had from a reporter, um, we had chosen reflecting absence. <clears throat> uh, and you've probably, if you haven't visited the memorial, you've seen images of the uh, footprints filled with uh, waterfalls, uh, huge empty voids, um, water streaming down the sides with further voids at the very center, <clears throat> about 35 feet below grade. And the, the voids at the center seem to be <clears throat> emptying into uh, nothingness all the way down to bedrock. Um, the uh, plaza is filled with uh, white swamp oaks, um, uh, uh, really a couple hundred of them. Uh, which the larger they grow, of course, the deeper the volumes of the voids will become, and the taller the buildings grow, the deeper the voids uh, of that whole space will, will seem. And uh, we love that design. <clears throat> we love the way that the trees um, would represent the regeneration of life downtown, and the voids would represent, of course, the lives that can never be recovered. Uh, loss is remembered by loss, new life remembered by new life, life remembered with life. Um, and the first question I had was from uh, a reporter at the Forward who said, look, we know that you've worked on the Denk Mall in Berlin, that you've talked and written quite a bit about counter monuments, uh, negative form monuments, <clears throat> disappearing monuments, um, monuments and voids. Um, haven't you all, referring to the jury, just chosen um, yet another Holocaust memorial for your 9-11 memorial downtown? And at first I was kind of taken aback and, and surprised and even a little offended. But then as I began to formulate my answer, um, I realized that in fact, the reporter was, was onto something that obviously this wasn't a yet another Holocaust Memorial, but that the architect's uh, preoccupation with absence and voids and how to articulate um, uh, lost, uh, lost lives Without, uh, without filling the void in somehow, um, and how to remember life with life and loss with loss um, has become a, a major preoccupying theme of contemporary art and architecture. And I would even say uh, post-Holocaust uh, literature, philosophy, music, um, composition, also preoccupied uh, with how to formalize loss <clears throat> without filling it in, without redeeming it in some way. So I'm going to show a few pictures <clears throat> because you know what um, this reminded me uh, of. First, of course, was a, a dinner I had uh, with Maya Lin very early on, not long after um, her memorial uh, design was realized in 1982, when it was finally uh, uh, finally dedicated and how, um, let's see. Okay, excuse me. <clears throat> hmm. 
There we go. So I'm going to let all these pictures uh, go up because once I go into the slide mode <clears throat> where nothing shows, um, when I get out, I can't go back in. Um, <clears throat> so I remember this dinner where she said, you know, my Vietnam Veterans Memorial really owes a, a, a debt to a couple other memorials. One of them was one memorial by Edwin Lutens for the missing of the Battle of the Somme, and the other a um, memorial on the Ile de uh, Cité uh, in Paris. Uh, right by the Notre Dame Grand Cathedral. Uh, this memorial to the, what is called the <clears throat> Memorial to the Deporté or to the Deported Jews um, of, uh, of France uh, was designed by Henri Pangrouchon um, in the late 50s and realized in 1962. And as you see, it's kind of, it's carved into the ground. You have to go down a very narrow stairwell to uh, get down to um, kind of a carved out area where the sights and the sounds of the city are really um, kind of occluded. You can see just the spire there of the Notre Dame Cathedral uh, right, be, right next door. And I'm gonna read for you how uh, this was described by the defense minister at the time. <clears throat> See, <clears throat> according to the Ministry of Defense at the site, <clears throat> this monument was inaugurated on April 12, 1962 by General de Gaulle, President of the French Republic, as a place of contemplation and remembrance of the suffering caused by the deportation of 76,000 Jews, including 11,000 children. It was created by the architect Georges-Henri Pengouchon and depicts certain features that define the concentration camp environment, narrow passages, tight staircases, spiked gates, restricted views with no sight of the horizon, and frequent references to the triangle, the distinctive mark of the deporte. So these kind of uh, thematically and formally end up constituting the, comprising the elements of this memorial. And Maya described kind of sitting down there in her junior year uh, abroad in, in France, in Paris, and feeling kind of the, the emptiness, something that had been carved out of the ground, especially with these triangles. And <clears throat> if you go across the River Seine from this memorial, <clears throat> you, it looks like the, the prow of a ship. It's kind of a, like a big sharp elbow going into the river, but from inside, you're, you're from the, you're on the inside of the triangle here, and that's the space that's opened up, which, you know, I've suggested before, by opening up the space in the ground, we would carve a space open for ourselves to remember. So the next year, Maya came home and submitted this design for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, I think America's greatest uh, counter monument in the way that it counterpoints all the traditional um, uh, white neoclassic uh, uh, monoliths uh, in Washington, D.C. Instead of uh, kind of the, the white monoliths, this is a, a, a negative form. It's carved into the ground. Um, at first, it was a little controversial, but in fact, it was uh, voted unanimously um, uh, uh, by the jury, which included and headed by Michael Van Valkenburg, who was also on the 9-11 Memorial Jury, as was Maya Lin, <clears throat> both of us uh, on that jury. And what Maya has done here <clears throat> is to take one of the most aggressive military um, architectural forms, the flying wedge, the spear, the point of an arrow, uh, the, the elbow jetting like this, and instead of creating that flying wedge or that military form, she's countered it by opening it up with, into the crook of an arm and an embrace, inviting us to descend down into it. One axis points toward the Washington Monument, the other one toward the Lincoln Memorial. <clears throat> there are no figures except for the reflections of ourselves, <clears throat> so that they're only humanly proportioned. And this is also a memorial that you have to go into and out of. And again, I'm going to quote the words of Maya Lin here because um, she gets it exactly right in her own description. 
of her design. <clears throat> she says she imagined taking a knife and cutting into the earth, opening it up, an initial violence and pain that in time would heal. That is, she opened a space in the landscape <clears throat> that would open a space within us for memory. In her words again, I never looked at the memorial as a wall or as an object, but as an edge to the earth, an open side. So instead of a positive V form, like a jutting elbow or spear tip or flying wedge, you know, military formation, she opened the V, V's obverse space, a negative space to be filled by those who come to remember within its embrace. Moreover, as Maya Lin described in her original proposal, quote, the memorial is composed not as an unchanging monument, but as a moving composition to be understood as we move into and out of it. That is, as a monument would be fixed and static. Her memorial would be defined by our movement through its space, memory by means of perambulation or walking through. And these are all innovations um, that were completely cutting edge um, at the time and which actually broke the mold of the traditional memorial for a whole generation of uh, German uh, memorial makers uh, during the 80s. That if um, Maya Lin could somehow articulate the terrible ambivalence Americans felt in, in commemorating um, uh, the Vietnam War and, and the, the deaths of uh, some 59,000 American soldiers, that maybe the Germans could figure out a way to commemorate a, uh, their own uh, you know, kind of original national crime, uh, the Holocaust. And so this generation, including Horst Hoheisel, uh, understood that, um, that just as Maya had broken the, broken the mold, they would now break a mold <clears throat> and take the monument and counterpoint it, the traditional monument. So for their National Memorial for Europe's Murdered Jews, Horst Hoheisel proposed taking the Brandenburger Tor, that is the National Monument of Germany, <clears throat> and blowing it up <clears throat> and leaving just a gigantic void behind, which should be become filled by the visitors who come looking for it. <clears throat> that is, one destruction, the destruction of the Jews of Europe, would now be commemorated by destroying the National Monument reminding everybody of what, you know, Hoheisel and this whole generation really thought was the inadequacy of monuments and also their great mistrust of the monumental after the exploitation of the monumental by the Nazi dictatorship and, and uh, even subsequently by uh, the, the Soviet Union. There's authoritarian regimes loved authoritarian art like gigantic monuments, which make individuals, of course, feel very small and insignificant. So this, this generation wanted to find a way to commemorate the destruction of the Jews without redeeming this, this destruction or I mean, through memory, remembering loss with loss, remembering the void with, you know, with the void, remembering absence with absence. So with this in mind, Jochen Gertz and his then wife Esther Shalev Gertz, uh, an Israeli artist, teamed up to propose this monument for peace <clears throat> you know, and against war, uh, kind of a generic Holocaust memorial, in which <clears throat> they took a 12 meter tall lead covered column and then invited citizens of Harburg, this is a little uh, suburb, <clears throat> kind of an immigrant um, uh, suburb uh, just over the river from Hamburg in Germany. We invite the citizens of Harburg and visitors to the town to add their names here to ours. In doing so, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant as more and more names cover this 12 meter tall lead column. It will gradually be lowered into the ground. One day it will have disappeared completely and the site of the Harburg monument against fascism will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. And here the artists point out what I think is the maybe the most revolutionary uh, um, aspect of this, of all these counter monuments, that never again <clears throat> would they allow their monuments and memorials to symbolically rise up against injustice. They need to return the burden of memory and the responsibility to memory to the visitors who come looking for it. 
that this monument making, memorial making must not become a substitute for action. In the end, we rise up against injustice, not our memorials. And this was, this was crucial. So the, by creating this memorial that disappears, everybody has their names in nice uh, meter and a half uh, spaces. <clears throat> and every time meter and a half gets filled up, it gets lowered into the ground. But of course this means swastikas appear, um, all kinds of graffiti uh, appears. The, the town at first hated it uh, because it was so um, ugly and such what they call the trap for filth. But the artist said, but doesn't every memorial just reflect back to society its preoccupations, it's like holding up a mirror to the society around it. And I do agree. And I said, besides, the faster you fill it up, the faster it's going to shrink and, you, and you'll get rid of it. So for them, this is the perfect metaphor. How do you remember something you might actually rather forget? You, you create a disappearing, vanishing monument. But significantly, when it's gone, it thereby returns the burden of memory to those who come looking for it. So that in standing there, we visitors now become the only vertical forms here. And this is, this is clearly um, meant to counterpoint um, kind of the monument sustaining illusions, <clears throat> you know, that, uh, that somehow they're, that, you know, they're naturally ordained or even divinely appointed, um, you know, built by nations that would hope that they would uh, last as long as the monument would last. Uh, when in fact, all of these things, there's human production that uh, are just as ephemeral as, as the generations that, that build them. A few years later, Jochen Gerritz taught a class in Saarbrücken at the Institute of Fine Arts there on monument making, uh, where he invited half the class to go out <clears throat> and steal cobblestones from the town square here, uh, sorry, the Zarbrucker Schloss, the castle, which had been Gestapo headquarters during World War II, and take these cobblestones back up to the classroom where the other half of the class was researching every single last Jewish cemetery in Germany destroyed by the Nazis during World War II, all 2,162 of them. They carved the names of those towns where these cemeteries were located, dating them on the date that they uh, carved these, this would have been <clears throat> um, in 1991. And then return the cobblestones to the square, but this being a Jochen Gerritz production, of course, they returned them inscribed side down so that there's no record of this. This has now become <clears throat> the, the square of the invisible monument. And of course, when uh, people came down, flocking down the square to see the new memorial, you know, 2,162 stones against racism, as it's called, uh, they found no inscribed stones. They were all turned upside, you know, turned down into the earth. And the students just said quite simply, um, look, look within yourselves for the memory you hope to find here. And of course, they are the, you know, the visitors are the only standing vertical objects you know, here on the square. And that became really, really important. Again, always returning that bird of memory to the people who come looking for it. And so here's this generation of German artists um, really pushing hard against the traditional monument, <clears throat> against its pretensions, against its kind of authoritarianism, you know, the, uh, the gigantic memorial or monument <clears throat> that you know, makes people seem very small and returns the burden of memory to those who come to remember. Horst Hoheisel again, about the same time the Gertzes were building or designing their, uh, uh, their disappearing memorial in Harburg in 1986, uh, Hoheisel proposed uh, taking uh, an original uh, monument <clears throat> called the Ashrot Fountain uh, which has been destroyed by the Germans in 1938 because uh, Zygmunt Aschrod was a Jewish philanthropist who donated this to the city of Kassel. And uh, when Kassel wanted to you know, rebuild this neo-Gothic pyramid, Hoheisel proposed not rebuilding it, but taking the original form and turning it into the ground. <clears throat> so this is what you would now get. Water would now fill instead of, um, instead of a, a fountain of spray coming up, the water fills this little channel uh, every 15 minutes or so and then pours down into it. And you can look through the window if you're standing there and see <clears throat> kind of the, the reflected space of the memorial 
but now pointed down into the ground. And of course, in, in Horst Hoheisel's um, uh, description, he said that uh, basically I wanted to create a plinth or, or a pedestal for the people who come here. They become the only standing forms now looking down in and contemplating the, the destruction of this, um, this you know, <clears throat> Jewish donated uh, fountain you know, to the city of Kassel. And yet another example <clears throat> in Berlin, uh, a memorial competition to the uh, book burnings, the Nazi book burnings of uh, March 1933, uh, was won by an Israeli artist, Misha Ullman, <clears throat> who proposed what he called bibliotheque <clears throat> or library. Um, this, this is at the Babelplatz, <clears throat> uh, right across from Humboldt University near, near the Opera House uh, here in Berlin. Um, he created a window, which is right there in the middle, and then two plaques. Uh, one plaque describes the book burnings and the other uh, tablet um, is a quote from Heinrich Heine, where books are burned, so too will people be burned one day as well. The only standing forms here, again, once again, are the, are the visitors who come and they look down to, into the room, into the bibliotheque, and of course, this library is a room of empty bookshelves. The books were burned, the authors were killed. They cannot be replaced. They're gone forever. And here, Michel Ullmann would once again articulate absence with absence, missing, but missingness by, you know, missing books. Um, it's, it's a striking and a strikingly beautiful, uh, you know, window. And the theme of books here, missing books that can never be replaced, just like the authors can never be replaced, um, is, what's, is what he wanted to formalize. Asking that question yet again, how to remember life with life, how to remember loss with loss without filling it in. And so you can see how this arc, you know, has moved really from uh, World War I, the missing of the sum, which I didn't show you <clears throat> to the, uh, to the memorial uh, carved into the ground in the Ile de Cité in Paris through these counter monuments <clears throat> preoccupied by voids. This is a, a piece by Rachel Whiteread, <clears throat> who has also taken the idea of the voids and absence. Her work traditionally uh, uses what she calls materiality as an index of absence. She proposed taking the space between the leaves of a book, the pages of a book, and the wall of the library, <clears throat> and then turning it inside out, materializing that, that, that space with nothing in it, and creating this memorial, also called Bibliothek in Vienna, at uh, the Judenplatz, <clears throat> the site of a, a, a terrible pogrom in <clears throat> 1521, in which all the Jews uh, were burned alive in the synagogue on this site. <clears throat> So it is. It was realized. Um, I write about this. It, it's, it was controversial again at the time, but again, um, that preoccupation with uh, remembering the people of the book, you know, with the a, a thematic, you know, uh, formalization of the book or the library here, um, but doing it by articulating that space, just that space between the leaves of the book and the walls of the uh, of the library itself. Shimon Ati in 1991, an American then California uh, born artist, <clears throat> went to Berlin and uh, was kind of uh, stunned by what he didn't see, which was any sign of uh, Jewish life in, in what was called the, <clears throat> uh, you know, kind of the, the, the Schoenenviertel or the, the, the barn district here in, in Berlin. He went into the archives and found hundreds of photographs <clears throat> taken in these streets and of these buildings of Jewish life uh, during the 20s and, and early 30s, and then projected them back onto the sites themselves, the original sites, <clears throat> to show what is now missing. Again, realizing that these sites by themselves are completely amnesiac, <clears throat> that we need to project on them what our mind's eye has already seen somewhere else. 
So this is a kind of memorializing these sites and by reminding them of what was once here. Um, and visually, they're stunning. It's almost like a palimpsest, like you peel away the surface and you find uh, the Hebrew bookstore, for example, or the, <clears throat> the Jewish bakery, or a Jewish theater here. And again, for him, it was how to, uh, to reanimate these otherwise amnesiac sites with, what's, with, with what is now missing. So that missingness was the key for him. And finally, the, um, the, the Denkmal in Berlin actually underwent uh, two different, it was eventually uh, uh, won uh, in a second competition. The first competition was overthrown. In the second competition, uh, I was asked to join a jury of five. We invited 25 artists and architects uh, to propose, um, again, the Denkmal, uh, a memorial for the Denkmal. And uh, Daniel Liebeskind, who designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin, proposed this design, what he called Stone Breath, um, which we liked a lot. Uh, this was like kind of the, the third, third runner up. <clears throat> you can see um, by the site here that he's taken a wall and, and, and created uh, these, these breaches in it, gaps in it. Um, reminding us a little of his design for the Berlin, uh, for the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which of course is um, based on this idea of six voids built into uh, uh, the museum to interrupt any kind of uh, seamless narrative of Jewish life in Germany. Again, to, to suggest that <clears throat> uh, Jewish history was breached in Germany and that you now have to remember the breaches somehow without filling them in. So this, this motif is picked up again here in his design uh, for the Denkmal. The runner-up to the winning design <clears throat> was proposed by Gesina Weinmiller, a, a young German uh, architect, a design we all loved. In fact, we voted it uh, number one in our very first round of voting. But here you can see that again, um, echoing a little bit of that Maya Lin, instead of the triangle, uh, she's created this um, three-sided space that you would descend down into, um, faced with gigantic limestone blocks, the size of the blocks of the Western Wall in Jerusalem, or the Kotel, um, 18 segments of them, <clears throat> uh, seemingly randomly arranged. But we found when we walked along the parapet here, when we got to this right-hand corner and looked at it, that it was basically um, a star of David would begin to, to congeal. And then as we continued, it would fall apart. Um, something we liked, <clears throat> but worried that um, would, you know, could become a little bit gimmicky. But once again, we liked that everybody would have to find their own way through this. Um, everybody's path would be a little bit different. Um, it would also block out part of Berlin. This is, these are large, tall walls, you know, some 30 feet high and the, the segments themselves um, uh, would recall uh, the, the, the Kotel. And of course, there are 18 of them, uh, which in Hebrew gematri is chai or life. And in the end, <clears throat> we chose uh, Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra's design, the 4,200 Stelle, ranging in height from ground level to uh, almost 30 feet tall. Uh, each one about three degrees off plum. They're just a kind of a waving, waving field, <clears throat> which we asked them to, to size down. Um, there was something so, so big and so dangerous and threatening. Uh, we knew that kids would run out over the tops of these and fall. Uh, we didn't want it to be uh, literally dangerous. We wanted you know, the memory of the Holocaust uh, to oppress, but not to, um, you know, to actually threaten the lives of the visitors, uh, at which point <clears throat> Peter Eisenman uh, was glad to give us a revised version, but Richard Serra left the project because he said part of my part of the, my memorial logic is the danger of these gigantic uh, these gigantic stelle, and if you size them down, it's is no longer you know, my work. So Eisenman took this over. This was the space, about a five acre space, 
um, right in the middle of Berlin, this former ministerial gardens, <clears throat> right between uh, Postamaplast and the uh, Brandenburger Tor. It's the wall ran right through it. It was really kind of a no man's land. And um, perfectly sighted, if you go to the very tip top of the, the East German flag, that area used to be on the east side of the, of the Berlin Wall. Um, that's right where Hitler's bunker was, uh, where his and uh, Eva Brown's uh, bodies were, were, were burned right there. And that whole site now <clears throat> is just uh, basically a sto stone's throw from the Dijk Mall itself. This is, was Eisenman's second design, 2,711 Stelle, ranging in height from ground level again to about you know, seven or eight feet tall. Some might be about nine feet tall. And again, we love that it seemed to be um, in constant motion, like a waving field of wheat. It wasn't, um, <clears throat> it, it wasn't meant to be like a, a, a solid military cemetery, but one in which the ground seemed to move beneath you as you walk through it. <clears throat> All blank faced. And when we finally recommended it to the Bundestag, uh, we recommended it in uh, four parts. We said, vote yes on having a central memorial to Europe's murder Jews in Berlin on this site. Vote yes on, the, it's Peter Eisenman's revised design, design number two vote to create a foundation to support this memorial in perpetuity and vote to create a place of information built beneath it and this they did <clears throat> right around the time actually of the um, germany's uh, joining nato forces to stop uh, a certain genocide of uh, uh, kosovar albanians <clears throat> Uh, by the Serbs. And so it was the, the discussion around the Denk Mall uh, was wound up uh, and even summarized by the then uh, Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer, who reminded everybody that it was not enough to create the uh, Denk Mall, but you had to act on the basis of this memory. And so he allowed German forces for the first time since World War II to leave German soil and German warplanes to join NATO warplanes uh, to bomb the Serbs into withdrawing uh, from Kosovo. So again, these themes, the responsibility <clears throat> of the memorial to inspire action and intervention and not become a substitute you know, for action um, picked up again and again in Germany. And what one of the things I especially love is the place of information built below. You descend uh, um, in one quadrant down into a space which was designed by um, Dagmar von Wilken, a, a great German uh, museum designer, who created a space in which the Stelle seemed to come down into the space, cre you know, creating kind of a, uh, an interlocking space of abstract memory above with very hard history below seeming to allow the Stelle to come down and interpenetrate, memory interpenetrating with history. History as a foundation for abstract memory above. <clears throat> and we had this in mind uh, a little bit as we contemplated exactly where the museum would go um, downtown. Uh, the 9-11 uh, museum, which is built, as you know, uh, beneath the abstract uh, reflecting absence uh, footprints above it. Again, that abstract design being supported below by hard history. And the kids did run out, just as we were afraid they would. <clears throat> now, just a couple of other <clears throat> um, memorials Again, unexpected. Um, this uh, Stolpersteiner by Gunther Demnig <clears throat> is, dates back to 1997, where he began um, researching the addresses uh, of uh, German Jews at first who were deported and killed. 
and creating what he called stumbling stones, <clears throat> little brass stones uh, instead of cobblestones. Uh, he would have these little brass stones just slightly elevated in order to trip you up. <clears throat> Each one inscribed with the names of deported Jews uh, and where they were killed. There are now uh, tens of thousands of these all throughout Europe. Um, <clears throat> and for many people, it's one of the most effective that <clears throat> you need to stumble upon these uh, just in daily life, <clears throat> just that the Jews, you know, Germany had to navigate uh, the anti-Semitic anti laws, Nuremberg laws on a daily basis in Germany. <clears throat> now, uh, Germans need to navigate uh, the memory <clears throat> of the Jews who died during the Holocaust on their everyday walks to and from a store, a theater, uh, a date in Germany. And these are everywhere throughout Europe now. And one of the last, uh, I give one of my favorite new memorials, also designed by Horst Hoheisel and his artistic partner, uh, Andreas Knietz. <clears throat> is in a, a small town in Eastern, <clears throat> Eastern Germany, where they were asked to commemorate the synagogue that was burned down on Kristallnacht. <clears throat> they excavated and they found the walls of the synagogue, <clears throat> uh, the foundation of the synagogue, and designed a wall to be built on this foundation uh, all the way around but completely enclosed. So there's no way to get in knowing that the wind would drop seeds, birds would drop seeds, um, that life would take hold in there, no matter what. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> and sure enough, life does take hold. So now you commemorate the, the lives lost with newly planted life here with the story of the synagogue and how it was burned down on Kristallnacht. So instead again of reconstructing a synagogue, they reconstructed a space which you cannot enter. It's impossible to re-enter history, but you can, but you can remember it. <clears throat> and, you, and you have to trust that life again will take hold within this space. And just to complete, you know, kind of this, um, th this arc, uh, America's newest and maybe newly greatest uh, National Memorial <clears throat> for Peace and Justice, also known as the Lynch Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, has taken, Brian Stevenson has acknowledged, taking the idea of the Stelle, but instead of anchoring them in the ground, he was, he, he saw the Denkmal, you know, he toured uh, Berlin and saw how the Denkmal had anchored these seeming gravestones in the ground. Um, but he now, instead of anchoring these in the ground, these would be suspended from the ceiling. Each of these six feet, about six feet high, about the size of a human being, each uh, engraved with the county's name and the, and the names of African-Americans lynched. Uh, about 802 different counties represented here <clears throat> with about 4,200 names. And as visitors walk in, the ground begins to descend. So you end up walking underneath these. So instead of anchoring them in the ground, they're now anchored in the heavens, but they're also, as you can see, uh, this, this gesture toward, toward lynch, lynch, lynch bodies. Um, part of the amazing genius of Brian Stevenson is that he has um, the, Equal Justice Initiative, uh, which uh, inspired uh, this memorial and built it, has reproduced each one of these, uh, some 804 of these stele, and laid them and um, stacked them neatly just outside this, this memorial, inviting every single county named on one of these, one of these columns, one of these monuments, to come claim it and take it home and have like a, a homecoming ceremony where you, where the county would now own this history and create a site for memory by taking one of these to it. So it's like a, it's become a, a mobile 
a form of memory, something that you need to take back with you to the specific counties. Do we have uh, time, Molly and Liz, uh, to look at the conception of the uh, I'm sorry. The the 11 memorial, per se. Yeah, just a just a few so, minutes, and then we'll. So this we'll idea of the boys. Remember, we opened with this question: Have you just created another Holocaust memorial? And of course, the answer was no. But all of literature, culture, um, architecture, art. Um, after the Holocaust really did uh, become preoccupied with this notion of absence and loss and how to articulate it. Michael Arad um, uh, proposed, this is Daniel Liebeskin's drawing of what it would be. But Michael Arad, uh, within two months of the 9-11 attacks, drew this little uh, sketch of what a memorial might be. He moved the 200 foot square acre um, spaces from the footprints into the harbor, uh, right near actually the Museum of Jewish Heritage, Battery Park, the, the, the harbor right there, where he wanted to put them in the water, uh, water flowing down the sides. He even created a water table on his rooftop to see what this would look like. So again, he's preoccupied by the voids, the spaces left behind, that would constantly, uh, water would falling down, but would constantly not be filled in. And so this was the basis for his memorial proposal um, uh, two years later when we actually ran the competition. You know, we received 5,201 designs from 62 countries. We ended up with Michael Arad's design and then working with him uh, to find a, a landscape architect who arrived at a beautiful um, abacus grid of trees to accompany these voids. <clears throat> um, the trees, as you see from uh, what he calls this abacus grid from, from east to west or from west to east, they would be these nice neat rows, <clears throat> just like the city grid in New York City. But when you're looking from north to south or south to north, um, they look like they're randomly arranged so that you have both the city grid and then you have the randomness of a, uh, of a forest. Um, just a, a, a perfect balance there at, at ground zero. So of course the voice for him uh, would be to recall the lives lost and never to be um, you know, lost forever, um, but also to be consoled in the morning act uh, by regenerating life in the flora uh, and even in the fauna of birds and the people who you now come to visit. The waterfalls fall constantly, but never, never fill in the voids. So that in the end, my answer to that inquiring reporter was to suggest that uh, this arc would now have to be about the you know memory and the spaces between that are never really filled <clears throat> and the role of the visitor in in uh, finishing if you will any of these memorial sites <clears throat> this is as you know built on top of the museum the museum is built below it so you've got these abstract designs above supported by the hard historical history of the day below. The names are arranged in what Michael Arbad called meaningful adjacencies, <clears throat> where every single family was asked who they would like their family, lost family, lost loved one's name to be by. And they picked four or five other names and they found an algorithm by which every family could have its wish and be surrounded by in some of the cases of firefighters or flight attendants or people from the office, but everybody got their wish this way. And again, those voids at the very center. So I guess, um, you know, when you visit um, and 
and everybody gets a chance to come to the to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Um, you've got to do a little bit of a, a memorial trek uh, from the great <clears throat> Garden of Stones there at the museum by Andy Goldsworthy to the 9-11 uh, Memorial and Museum, and even to the, there's a Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, down in Battery Park City as well. 